Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. To open, I humbly start with a land acknowledgement to recognize the indigenous tribes of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples of the Wampanoag Tribal Confederation territories who both past and present and through many generations have stewarded the land where the Kennedy Library is today. While the land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility and it serves as a reminder that we are on stolen and settled indigenous land. I invite us all to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and to learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute and AT&T, and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. Our bookstore will be selling copies of Mark Updegrove's new book if you're interested. Details and a link are in the description for tonight's program on our YouTube page. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We're delighted to have this opportunity to explore President Kennedy's life and legacy with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. We're so glad to welcome Mark Updegrove back to the Kennedy Library virtually. A presidential historian and the author of five books on the presidency, he currently serves as the president and CEO of the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation and the presidential historian for ABC News. Earlier in his career, he was the director of the LBJ Presidential Library and a publisher of Newsweek. He has interviewed seven US presidents. His newest book is Incomparable Grace, JFK in the Presidency. I'm also delighted to welcome to the library virtually our moderator for this evening, Martin Dobrow. He is professor of communications at Springfield College. He is also an author, a national award-winning journalist and a podcaster whose work is focused on issues of race and social justice. He has published more than 2000 articles in a variety of newspapers, magazines, and online outlets, including The Atlantic, The Washington Post, ESPN.com, and the Boston Globe. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you so much for that very gracious introduction, Alvin. What a great honor and privilege it is to be here today with my lifelong friend, Mark Updegrove, a renowned presidential historian and the author of the superb book that we will be discussing tonight incomparable grace, JFK and the presidency. Mark and I have known each other since 1978. We met as teenagers in the back country of Yosemite National Park, and we would never know it back then, but you clean up pretty well, Mark. How are you doing today? <laughs> uh, so likewise, my friend, you didn't have to tell everybody that we that, that we we were teenagers in in the seventies. That that dates us, Marty. That's, that's, uh, that's yeah, awesome. I hear you. No, it's it's <laughs> it is true. And uh, you know, thinking that uh, we're going to be talking a lot about the sixties, what a consequential decade. And lo and behold, here we are in our sixties now. How did that happen? I don't know. Uh, so congratulations uh, on this latest latest book i think it it really is a a masterpiece no less uh, in authority than uh, doris kearns goodwin who i think knows her way around presidents and biographies uh, said in this tremendously absorbing and inviting portrait mark Updegrove delivers a warm yet unflinching examination of john fitzgerald kennedy his deep knowledge of the presidency allows him to convey the political complexity of the issues without ever losing the narrative flow. This is an important book that captures the energy, hope, and vision of a young president navigating a potential nuclear confrontation, a gathering storm in Vietnam, and the struggle for justice at home. So those are pretty impressive words from a very impressive historian. Uh, you must have been very, very pleased to get uh, 
th- that accolade from from Doris Kearns Goodwin, I would imagine. Doris, that, that's like uh, you know Babe Ruth telling you you did pretty well at bat. But uh, <laughs> I, well, let me just say, Marty, before we jump into this discussion, how honored it, I am to to be uh, speaking under the auspices of the John F. Kennedy Library, and I want to thank Alan Price for that uh, very generous introduction. I have enormous respect for for John Kennedy, and having been in the Lyndon Johnson orbit for almost 13 years as the director of the LBJ Presidential Library and now the CEO of the LBJ Foundation, John F. Kennedy is part of my daily life, so it was a particular pleasure for me to delve into this book and to really understand intimately the enormous challenges he faced as our 35th president, and I'm delighted to have this conversation with you, my uh, my dear friend. As am I. and. Uh, so, of course, we had hoped that this was going to be an in-person event. That was the, the great plan to uh, converge in Boston was not to be because of COVID. And so we've set up this sort of uh, technological triangle here uh, between the JFK Presidential Library in Boston, the LBJ Presidential Library in Austin, and my office here at Springfield College, uh, where I would like to say there is some legitimate JFK history. Uh, when JFK was a senator from Massachusetts, he came here to deliver the commencement address in 1956, eight years before Martin Luther King came to the same campus under some extraordinary circumstances to give his commencement address. On a Monday in November of 1960, uh, John F. Kennedy came to Springfield, not to the campus, but came to Springfield uh, as part of a big tour. The next day, he was elected president of the United States. And then just two miles uh, from this campus in Forest Park, uh, right near my home, there is an eternal flame memorial to JFK. Uh, I believe the only other one in the country is at Arlington Memorial Cemetery. So we like to believe that we belong here in this sort of pantheon with these presidential libraries. But let's, uh, to, to, uh, use a famous phrase from, from President Kennedy, Kennedy, let us begin. Uh, Mark, when we, we saw each other last, it was in 2014 at the Civil Rights Summit in Austin, an amazing event that you put together that involved a number of U.S. presidents, civil rights icons like John Lewis, Bernice King, Andrew Young. Um, you know, you were talking about your long involvement at the LBJ Foundation. And when we were talking the other day, you said a very funny thing to me. You said that in writing this book, that you almost felt that you were cheating on LBJ. <laughs> what, 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 did, what did you mean by that? Well, you know, it, it, the funny thing is that, that um, there is, uh, there, there, there are a lot of mythologies around uh, Lyndon Johnson and, and John F. Kennedy. And I, I, it, there was controversy uh, about their, their legacies, their relationships. Uh, there, there's a lot of confusion about the relationship between the Kennedys, which has tended to be sort of conflated, and Lyndon Johnson. And the, I think folks felt like they had to pick a lane. I'm a Kennedy guy or I'm a Johnson guy. I see these legacies as highly complementary. Um, the, John F. Kennedy creates this high tide of liberalism. He gets us believing in ourselves as a nation. He gets us reaching beyond ourselves thinking about something greater. The ask not what your country can do, but what you can do for your country became this eternal expression of American ideals, that we should be looking beyond ourselves and trying to contribute to the country that we love. And Americans believe that. He's inspiring. He's optimistic. He's hopeful. And we go along with that. Uh, He's struck down in his prime, but our faith in government remains. So when Lyndon Johnson takes the presidency in 1964, our faith in government is at an all-time high of 77 percent. Put that in perspective, it's now in the 20s. So mm-hmm. Lyndon Johnson, that, that, that tide of liberalism spills over into the Lyndon Johnson presidency, and he's able to get done a lot of what Kennedy envisioned, a lot of what Franklin Roosevelt had envisioned. In some ways, Lyndon Johnson thinks of it as finishing the New Deal. So I see these legacies as totally complementary. So I, I said that jokingly about, about LBJ. He was famously thin-skinned when it came to the, the Kennedys, hence that remark. But, I, but these two presidents, I think, came in at the right time in our history for us to make real progress as a nation. 
yeah, and you speak, you kind of convey that sense of, of hope and optimism uh, and belief in government that uh, was evident in those days and is far less evident today. Uh, certainly encapsulated in that majestic inaugural address. And it's interesting, I mean, that's, you know, we, both of us came into the world into, you know, we were both born within a few months of JFK taking office. And I was so struck uh, in the way that you, you wrote about that period in the book about just this, this sense of freshness and newness and hope Certainly that accompanies every new presidency to a degree, but, but that moment, sort of at the beginning of a new decade, just seemed to be so rife with, uh, you know, a kind of nature's first green is gold optimism. W what is your sense as you kind of look back on that inaugural address and, and that particular moment in American history? You know, the amazing thing is, Marty, uh, that Lyndon, uh, you know, that, that uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson ride into uh, their victory with a two tenths of a percentage point margin. I mean, it was a squeaker. It, it, it uh, half of the country voted for the Republican ticket, and yet, in an, in a remarkably short period of time, John F. Kennedy just captivates America. And part of that was the vivacious. A Kennedy family that, that came with him into the, the White House. But uh, then he gets into, to, to goes to the inauguration. And this is the youngest president elect at 43, succeeding at the time the oldest outgoing president, Dwight Eisenhower, at 69. And it represents a brand new generation. The torch has indeed been passed, not to the ones, the, the, the generals of World War II, but those who were on the front lines of World War II. And that torch would remain with what we now call the greatest generation for 28 years. The successive presidencies of Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, uh, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, all were, they were all within 10 years of one another. So this is this historic moment, which, which is truly the end of an era for, for one generation, passing the torch on to another. And, and Kennedy really delivers in that moment with that iconic inaugural address, so much so that uh, five days later, when he gives his first press conference, a third of all Americans tune in. Press conferences can, can be pretty prosaic. Yeah. It's pretty banal stuff, but yeah. we are so in, captivated by this young, vigorous, hopeful president that we tune in and, and want to know what he's talking about. Uh, so it's a remarkable, in a remarkably short time, he has Americans totally swept up in this new administration. Yeah, it's really that passing of the torch uh, imagery. It's, it's interesting to look back that when Roosevelt turned 60 in 42, that we that ushered in a time from that moment until the moment when JFK took the oath of office the presidency was always in the hands of someone who was 60 or older for mm -hmm. such a long period of time from 1942 until January of 1961. And so that, that sense of youth, that sense of vitality, the hopefulness, um, and as you mentioned, it just, you know, just so delivered the goods with such a vibrant and energetic and hopeful address. Uh, it just, it must've been a remarkable thing to have witnessed. I love the way that you describe the this big snowstorm that hit Washington that day. It's just, you capture the moment so evocatively. It's one of the things that is, I think is a through line in this book, uh, in addition to, to such compelling history, is just a vividness of description that's really is, is cinematic. It, 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 you know, this is such a supercharged, dramatic presidency. Uh, and you just, you, you know, you capture it with, with such vividness, you know, really starting with that moment. So, well, thank you for that. I, you know, I think you, you have to, Marty, because that's the way the country felt at the time. First of all, the, the, the sheer drama that, that Kennedy faces throughout the course of his, his administration, there's one crisis after the next. He was in office, of course, for, for two years and 10 months, but so much that was consequential happened in that very short period of time. Uh, and so, so it, it sort of has to be cinematic, and it has to be a briskly 
paced narrative because as, as, as a reader, you want to feel what it must have felt like for John F. Kennedy to be in the White House, facing one, again, one crisis after the, the, the next. No doubt. But that, I mean, that briskness is that's from a writing perspective, that stuff is really hard won. I mean, to, to craft those paragraphs that are so evocative. I mean, that takes that takes a lot of time and a tremendous amount of attention to detail. I think it's just one of the, the really stirring parts of, of this book. It is interesting how you choose to uh, to begin the book when we say, let us begin. I mean, you're, you start in your prologue with that summit with Khrushchev. And I wonder if you could tell our audience a little bit about your thinking behind making that choice. Um, why start the book that way? Well, we, we, we celebrate, and rightfully so, that iconic inauguration speech from John F. Kennedy, but mostly it was about the Cold War. It was about paying any price and bearing any burden to ensure that we had freedom in the world. This is at a time when the dominant geopolitical issue was uh, the, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. We were battling for hearts and minds across the world for which system was better. We were enmeshed in this Cold War. And uh, it was also at a time when you had these two no nuclear powers rattling sabers from time to time. The bulk of Americans, when John F. Kennedy took the presidency, believed that there would be a nuclear exchange in their lifetimes. You and I are old enough to remember duck and cover drills in school. Sure. We are old enough to remember uh, those who built bomb shelters in their backyard. That, that sense that there could be a nuclear disaster, there could be annihilation, permeated the world. So uh, it's vitally important that John F. Kennedy look strong to his counterpart, uh, Nikita Khrushchev in the Soviet Union. And uh, that summit, which occurred in early June of 1961, was a, a very telling uh, 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 scene for, for, for John F. Kennedy. They're, the eyes of the world are on them, like they are two heavyweight champions battling for the crown. Uh, and, and expectations for John F. Kennedy, our new president who had so much favor, were high. Bear in mind this happens right after the Bay of Pigs fiasco uh, that uh, occurs in April of that year where uh, the United States stubs its toe by essentially sanctioning and supporting the incursion of an over uh, of Cuba and the overthrow of of Fidel Castro, the the, the leader of of Cuba. And I, I, pardon me, one sec. Do you need me? Sorry, my assistant is doing something. I think we have a technical issue. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, and Marty, the the. That is a, a huge quagmire. That is a huge fiasco. So uh, Kennedy stumbles pretty early on in his presidency. Uh, 115 Cuban exiles are killed. Thousands are taken in, taken captive. And Khrushchev sees this and sees in Kennedy somebody he believes to be weak. The summit that he has with Kennedy only reinforces that impression. And Kennedy knows it as he confesses to Scotty Reston, which is that, that first scene in the book, Scotty Reston, the renowned reporter from the Washington Post, or excuse me, from the New York Times, he has been savaged by Khrushchev, who leaves emboldened, believing that Kennedy, in his words, is too intelligent and too weak and can be exploited. Again, Kennedy knows this and tries to figure out how he can, he can uh, uh, dispel that impression from Khrushchev's mind. And that leads, of course, to the greatest crisis of Kennedy's administration, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happens in October of the following year. Yeah, I mean, those Cold War tensions just permeate this time of the Kennedy presidency in, in so many ways. I mean, ge geographically, you know, in, in Europe, this is the time of the, the Berlin Wall. There's obviously buildup in Southeast Asia, which is is also predicated on a lot of that fear of communism. And then in Cuba, you know, the, the two incidents that you, you referenced, the Bay of Pigs and obviously the Cuban Missile Crisis that, that brought us to the brink of some very dark and horrifying places. Uh, 
you know, obviously there are some some haunting echoes to our our current moment historically, and our current president is is also facing a challenging situation with how to to grapple with a very powerful and unpredictable leader in Russia with you know a big stockpile of nuclear arms. What what lessons would you say there are for President Biden from the Kennedy presidency that might be helpful? You know, one is I mentioned Kennedy uh, uh, took the the office with uh, huge acclaim. I mean, Republicans and Democrats alike were excited about his administration when he came in. Let me let me note that after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy's approval rating was stood at an astounding eighty three percent. Hmm. We were all lined up behind Kennedy. Only 5% of Americans disapproved of John F. Kennedy's job performance after the Bay of Pigs. But when he, when he comes back from his uh, inauguration and the, the, the balls that followed, uh, he crawls back to the White House in the early morning uh, hours of January 21st, 1961. The presidential bedroom is being renovated, so he he decides to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom, in the Lincoln bed. And uh, his friend, Charlie Bartlett, uh, a reporter, asks him the following day what it was like to sleep in the Lincoln bed. And Kennedy said, I just jumped in and hung on. <laughs> and I think that's, that's true for, for, for Biden. No person, no matter what their experience is, is prepared for the, the burdens of the presidency. They're too massive for any man or woman. But I think you just have to jump in and hang on. Biden had a very difficult first year, just as John F. Kennedy did. But like Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, he, uh, Biden has rallied Western nations around the cause of the liberation of Ukraine uh, in the face of the, the Russian invasion. Uh, bear in mind that NATO was extraordinarily weak due to the last administration. I think we have to give Biden credit for that. Mm -hmm. He can also learn from Kennedy the power of words, the power of, of a United States president uh, making a declaration. Uh, there's a, a, a quote from Clement Attlee that I use in the book. Clement Attlee was the successor to Winston Churchill, and he says of Churchill's oratory during the Second World War, uh, uh, words at great moments can be deeds. Kennedy shows us this time and time again in his presidency. Those words he uses to inspire us to go to the moon, we choose to go to the moon, uh, to, to say that all free men, whether they live in Germany or Berlin or not, are Berliners. And he mm -hmm. uses the words, ich bin ein Berliner, his American University speech. We talk, talked about the, the inauguration speech. At those moments, there's very crucial moments in history, those words are deeds. I, I missed one that I knew, you know you and I will talk about, which is when he elevates civil rights to a moral issue. That is a deed to the civil rights community. I think Joe Biden can, can uh, learn from Kennedy and the, the power of oratory for the United States president. No doubt, uh, you know, there were some amazing speakers during that, that era, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, JFK. I mean, there's some memorable oratory and it does, it's uplifting, uh, it's inspiring. Uh, it's something that people can can really hang on and be in, in, be inspired, be uplifted by, and that's uh, you know I think we saw that certainly in the Obama presidency as well. Uh, words matter; they really they have a huge importance. It was interesting. I mean, you referenced the uh, you know the the oratory about the decision to go to the moon. I mean, even that was you know imbued with this sort of Cold War friction because it was sort of the space race you you know you very skillfully chart this out in the book uh, starting with Sputnik and right on up that was a very bold move really important in terms of that uh, you know this this idea of maintaining some supremacy or gaining some supremacy in, in that dimension you know this is at a time in 1957 Sputnik went up and we we were fearful as a nation again uh, the Cold War being being at its height in the late 50s and early 60s, we were definitely fearful that the, the Soviets had gained a technological advantage. And one of the reasons that 
John F. Kennedy was successful in his presidential bid was by, by uh, offering this notion that there was a missile gap between the United States and the Soviet Union, that they had a nuclear advantage, a technological advantage over the United States. That was false, as it happened. We had a nine to one advantage in, in nuclear weaponry, but the American people believed it. And I think we were deeply fearful that the, the Soviet Union would gain an advantage by putting weapons in space. And so uh, they had leaped ahead of us in the space race. And Kennedy very boldly says to the country, we're going to put, not, we're not only going to get ahead of the Soviet Union, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. That was a preposterous notion when it was offered, given where we stood in the space race rel relative to the Soviets. But, uh, but Kennedy uh, learns that we can, we can do it from, from Lyndon Johnson as it happens and tells not only the nation, but the world that it's going to happen. That is an incredibly bold move on the part of the 35th president. No doubt about it. You, you referenced uh, civil rights and let's, let's turn our attention to that realm. Uh, this is certainly something that is, is deeply associated with the 1960s. It's the, you know, the social movements that we perhaps most, most remember. Uh, Kennedy, you make a strong case that he was really sort of a reluctant uh, adherent to, to civil rights and, and saw it perhaps as some sort of distraction to some of his larger goals. Uh, could you talk just a little bit about your sense of Kennedy's journey with civil rights? Well, it's a complicated one. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect what's in Kennedy's heart but it reflects the political difficulties that surround civil rights at the time. Kennedy, uh, as, as the uh, uh, Democratic nominee for the presidency in 1960, helps to get Martin Luther King released from a rural prison in Georgia where he is, faces almost certain death from either inmates or guards, white racist inmates and guards. And he not only calls Coretta Scott King and tells uh, her that he will intervene, he calls the governor of Georgia and gets Martin Luther King sprung, which again, probably saves his life. And Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., promises Kennedy a suitcase full of black votes as a, as a result of that, which he delivers on. So that certainly helps the, the cause of John F. Kennedy. When he becomes president, however, things are a little bit more complicated. John F. Kennedy wants to be a great president. Not only does he want the office of the presidency, he wants to be a great president. And he believes that great presidents are made through great foreign policy. That's not a surprise, again, given the geopolitical dynamics of the time. Again, the Cold War was the big issue of the time. Kennedy sees civil rights getting in the way of that. We are battling the Soviet Union, again, as I mentioned earlier, for hearts and minds. And part of that is, is, is ensuring that we have the moral high ground. So to some degree, the, the civil rights movement complicates things for Kennedy because it exposes the nation and the world to the very worst of American apartheid, right? Our bigotry, our, our systemic injustice. And Kennedy believes that that will not help him with the, the Soviet Union. In fact, when he goes, when he's about to go uh, to, uh, to Europe and to that summit I mentioned in Vienna with, with Khrushchev, uh, Bobby Kennedy says that be, they have to be very careful with the uh, the Freedom Rides, uh, which is civil rights uh, activists going on buses across the South to force the integration of the Capitol Trailways and Greyhound buses. Uh, but Bobby Kennedy says, you, if you continue to do this, the president's going to go to Europe with mud on his shoes, right? He's going to show the worst. Uh, you're going to reveal the worst of America. So they're trying to tamp down the civil rights movement, but it simply can't be contained. And so there's this struggle throughout the Kennedy presidency with uh, Kennedy resisting civil rights to a large extent and Martin Luther King and the soldiers of the movement pushing him forward to be, to be more progressive uh, in the issue of civil rights. And finally, things c uh, come to a head uh, in the, the, the late spring and summer of 1963. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating dynamic because obviously, you know, while Kennedy was in the Senate, you know, the, you saw through the mid 50s, uh, a lot of the 
the power of the movement, the momentum of the movement, Montgomery bus boycotts, uh, you know, the murder of Emmett Till, uh, you know, a number of circumstances that were extremely fraught and tense and violent around school integration. Uh, February of 1960, you start with the, the sit-in movements down in, in Greensboro. Um, and this was a, a building phenomenon. And certainly you mentioned you some powerful stuff in the book about the freedom rides and these, these buses that were ambushed and people were attacked in some really savage ways. And this was obviously very bad press for the country. Uh, it was not, you know, politically desirable. Um, it was hateful. It was violent. It was awful. And this this continued this sort of uh, escalating sense of violence in the in the movement. I mean, you you bring it to a crescendo, I think, in Birmingham uh, in the book in the spring of 63. And this these images of these you know, the fire hoses and the gnashing dogs, you know, sicked upon on children and the sense that Martin Luther King had effectively dramatized racial injustice and that America was really beginning to see it in a way that perhaps we had not seen it before. It was something that Kennedy ultimately really did have to deal with. And I think that's an inflection point, Marty, that, that, that campaign, uh, the, the direct action campaign, as, as they called it in the, in the movement in Birmingham, Alabama, which was the most segregated city in the United States. You talked about those gnashing dogs and you talked about those weaponized fire hoses. Those become images that are on the front pages of, of newspapers across the nation and the world. We also have the incarceration of Martin Luther King in a Birmingham jail where he writes his famous letter from the Birmingham jail. It's, it's to clergymen who have asked him to wait, just to counseling him to be patient in the area of civil rights, not to be provocative with this movement. And this is the, 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 uh, the, the letter that Martin Luther King writes on smuggled paper and toilet paper even, yep. that's smuggled out of the jail and put into uh, printed form is a, a, a essentially uh, the most eloquent expression that we can't wait, the, the time is now. Yep. And I think that finally uh, stirs the conscience of Bobby Kennedy and John F. Kennedy. And there is a, uh, a concurrent with this. There is the Bantam segregation as governor of uh, Alabama, George Wallace, standing in the schoolhouse door symbolically at the University of Alabama, preventing its integration. Uh, that is going to make the news that evening in, in early June of 1963. And John F. Kennedy has had enough at that point. And he decides to make a speech to the nation to kind of get ahead of the Wallace story uh, and make an appeal directly to the American people. His speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, doesn't have enough time to finish the speech. He tells Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy tells his brother, you need to go on the, the air anyway. Speak from your heart. So most of that speech, one of the most indelible that Kennedy gives throughout his administration, is extemporaneous, coming directly from the heart of John F. Kennedy. And as I mentioned earlier, Marty, that's when Kennedy elevates the civil rights cause to a moral issue. Martin Luther King, who's watching it and has been very critical of Kennedy and his caution throughout the course of his presidency relating to civil rights, watches that speech and, say, speech rather, and says, that white boy just hit it out of the park. Yeah, I mean, he was really goaded into action, spurred into action. Uh, it was, I mean, that's a remarkable moment when Kennedy goes on air and just, you know, live TV uh, finally calls it a moral issue. I think uh, Martin Luther King had implored him to do so just prior to that in the pages of the, in the New York Times. You mentioned, I mean, George Wallace at that moment. I mean, this was uh, presenting a figure, the specter in America of, you know, what would happen if a populist were really to take holds, could this happen? What would the, the dangers of this be? And, uh, you know, we began, we saw that confrontation. To me, that moment, you talk about an inflection point, I mean, June 11th, uh, 
when Kennedy goes on national television, gives this speech, uh, you know, you have the assassination of Medgar Evers, right, right immediately afterwards. You, and then you also internationally, I mean, you, you conjure that horrific image of that, the monk immolating at that very time too. And the, it's, this is a moment, I think, where the world is really seeing uh, this sort of searing violence and injustice and just there's a, it calls for great leadership, I guess. And there, 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 there are conflicts of, of situations in the spring and summer of 1963 that is unimaginable. But, you know, it's funny, Marty, because on the one hand, uh, Kennedy gives this soaring speech. Uh, and he, again, uh, calling the civil rights movement uh, uh, or a civil rights situation in the, in the country a, a moral issue. At the same time, the same month, he meets with civil rights leaders the, the, of the big six, the, different, the six different civil rights uh, uh, organizations at the time, the, the biggest. Uh, and they, they come to talk to him about a march on Washington for jobs and freedom that they're planning for August of that year, and Kennedy tries to dissuade them from doing yeah. it. He's afraid it's going to get out of hand. It's going to break out into a huge riot. And they tell them that, that Martin Luther King and John Lewis, by the way, are among them, those leaders. And, and they say, no, no, we're, good. we're going to go through with it. And John, uh, Kennedy watches, doesn't go to the, to the march, but watches it very carefully, as do most Americans, on the day that it, it plays out on August 28th. 1963 and afterwards it, it's enormously successful of course he watches Martin Luther King give his iconic I have a dream speech and and says he's damn good he's damn good <laughs> he invites the leaders to the White House afterward and he goes up to King and says I have a dream it's a really stirring moment he realizes it goes uh, goes down as well as he could have expected and again I think that helps to elevate the conscience of Americans around the issue of civil rights. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating vacillation uh, that Kennedy has this this sense of finding the heart to confront this. Uh, you know, up here in Western Massachusetts, uh, I believe it was uh, Kennedy's last moments in his home state. Uh, he came up to Amherst College, not too far from here. And, gave a speech that was a dedication of the Robert Frost Library. This was just a few weeks before the assassination. And the students at Amherst, which was then a, still an all-male school, had this very polite but insistent protest urging him to push forward on civil rights, to, to stand up for it. Uh, you know, he had essentially introduce the idea of civil rights legislation in that speech that that you reference. But it was not ultimately John F. Kennedy who would get that done. It would, would be Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and you have conjured this moment so beautifully in a couple of your books, this moment when, when LBJ in, in his first address to Congress, you know, really seizes on this that this is the thing that we're going to go after, that you know, no memorial oration would be more appropriate. I forget exactly the, the language that he used than to, you know, the, than the swift enactment of civil rights that you know John F. Kennedy had worked on for so long. Right. That that's arguable, I suppose. Well that's arguable, but but Lyndon Johnson was a master politician. And yeah. in this case he let no didn't let the crisis go to waste. Just as John F. Kennedy, as you referenced earlier, Marty said, let us begin uh, Lyndon Johnson evoking the invoking the, the the memory of John F. Kennedy says, let us continue. And one of the things he reinforces is the fact that John F. Kennedy wanted the Civil Rights Act to go through. It was languishing at the time of Kennedy's assassination in November of 1963, but but Johnson revives it using the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy to push it through a very reluctant Congress. And there's this wonderful scene of, of Kennedy meeting, or excuse me, make, Johnson meeting with his advisors. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a vice presidential residence in those days, so uh, Johnson meets at his home, the Elms, in northwest Washington. 
and they counsel him to wait on civil rights until he wins the presidency in his own right in 1964. Uh, and they also, they further suggest that he could lose the party to the South, which Johnson, being a political pragmatist, knows. And he listens to this advice, and there's a pregnant pause, and he looks at them and he says, what the hell is the presidency for? He knows he can use this moment to push through the Civil Rights Act that both he and John F. Kennedy so wanted for the country. Yeah, that's that's an amazing line, and it's and, you know it it speaks to the best of LBJ, uh, and a, you know just a great great moment. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which you approached. Uh, writing about the complications of, of John F. Kennedy. And in one sense, you're sort of uh, unsparing in evoking uh, a number of his extramarital affairs, uh, and yet the sense of Kennedy that emerges in this book, I think is overwhelmingly f favorable. How do you strike that balance of uh, looking at a person, looking at a president uh, at, in such an even-handed way. What, what are you after as a biographer? Yeah, I think you're after a, a, a faithful portrait of the person that you're, you're covering. It doesn't do us any good to mythologize historic figures. Uh, you know, you look at Martin Luther King, for instance, and, and we tend to make him a teddy bear. Uh, Martin Luther King was successful because he was fierce. He was so, uh, uh, he, was un, he was undaunted by, by these enormous challenges he had. And so uh, with John F. Kennedy, he's been mythologized. And it was easy to do that. He was struck down in his prime. Uh, there were the political aspirations of Bobby Kennedy. So it served to sort of create the Camelot myth around Kennedy and to glorify his memory, not only uh, uh, to, to ensure that Kennedy got a good place in history, but to help the political aspirations of Bobby Kennedy and, and Ted Kennedy, but but it it, it is a um, it is an unfair portrait of of Kennedy to to mythologize him. There are there are marked blemishes in his character, and they start with his his womanizing and his um, infidelity to to Jackie. There, those are really hard to to reconcile, honestly. Womenizing was part of the zeitgeist in Washington at the time. Um, you know, John F. Kennedy also grew up at the feet of the master. His father was famously unfaithful to his mother and had pretty open extramarital affairs. I think to some degree, womanizing was a way of keeping score in the very competitive, very testosterone-filled Kennedy household. So you have to deal with that. That is a part, an, a part of this president. I, I will say it, it doesn't affect his duties as president. It doesn't affect his ability to discharge the duties of the, the office that, that he holds. And that you have to give Kennedy credit for. As, as I mentioned, I, I really tried to capture the essence of who Kennedy was. And I labored at the very end of the book to, to summarize what I think the, the legacy of John F. Kennedy is. And here's what I came up with, Marty. Throughout the course of his restless, abridged reign in the White House, he dealt with the pressures of the office, standing on feet of clay at times, showing flashes of greatness at others. But all he did indelibly, honor and grace, edging out recklessness and abandon, calling forth the best in all of us. That's the, the best way I could sum up, I think, my thoughts on John F. Kennedy and what I think he means to our country, but ultimately that honor and grace does push out the recklessness and abandon, which is a part of his character. Yeah, and it's, I mean, beautifully written summation. I know another one of those, I think, just hard, hard writing moments where you have to confront these fundamental questions. I mean, who was the man? What was his essence? how can i encapsulate this as you know efficiently as as possible I, you mentioned kennedy's uh you know preference for conciseness and 
even thinking of his, his inaugural address, that it's just important to find a way to get to the truth as concisely and precisely as, as possible and sort of summoning people like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that's a moment, one of many moments, where I think you do that exquisitely well in the book itself. That's a, that's a, that's a tough, tough literary feat. We said words matter. I mean, that's what yeah. John F. Kennedy proves. And you've got to choose words very carefully to describe this one, too. You know, it, this is a, a Mad Men era president in yep. a Me Too era today. And and again, you have to you have to reconcile that. You know, there are the health issues, too. And the um, the fact that that Kennedy was not frank with the American people about the very serious health issues that he faced with Addison's disease. I, I enumerate all of the drugs that mm -hmm. Kennedy took throughout the course of his presidency for various ailments, including Addison's disease and his back back uh, trouble. And it is staggering yeah. the medical regimen on any given day. And uh, we we didn't know that at the time and probably should have. We have a right as a country to know about the health of our chief executive. Uh, uh, we we in the, in the Trump presidency, we were misled, I believe, uh, no. in terms of what the presidency, the president's health was. But as voters, as citizens of this country, that's something that we are owed by our chief executive. Yeah, that was uh, fairly fresh and new territory to me. I think you evoke that really powerfully in the book and, you know, just a, a few pages, what he was up against on a physical level, the challenges day to day were just enormous and his efforts to com combat them medically, the medical team that was, uh, you know, really trying to prop him up, keep him going. Uh, it was just, he was fighting some very serious battles. Well, one thing, another thing I wanted to ask you about is the sense of, of uh, John F. Kennedy as a sort of media presence. Uh, he, was someone who who was certainly made for the television age. Uh, how, how, in your sense, did did he really use media to his advantage during his his presidency? And how would that compare as you look back and you're you're so skillful at looking at the arc of presidencies? How other presidents have used used media that were you know prominent at their time of office? You know, there's one there's there's a very revealing interview that that Kennedy gives with Ben Bradley, who was then at the, the Washington Post. I, I, I take it back. He was at Newsweek at the time and would later go to The Washington Post. Uh, and he talks about the fact that he is the antithesis. He, he views himself as the antithesis of a politician. And he's thinking of principally about his 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 maternal grandfather, Honey Fitz, the the, the, the mayor of Boston, also a, a, a representative in Congress at one time. And, and this is the kind of backslapping, baby kissing, name knowing politician that is archetypal. Uh, and Honey Fitz certainly fit that mold. John F. Kennedy did not. He was cooler, he was more cerebral, he was more distant, more intellectual. But he also told Bradley that he felt he fit the times. And I think part of that was he knew that he could master the medium of the times, which was television. Great politicians do that. Jefferson did that with partisan newspapers. Uh, Lincoln did it with the written word. You know, most uh, at, at that time in the you know the 1800s, people weren't. You know, we didn't have uh, mass media media vehicles like radio and television. When a when a politician made a speech, it was mostly printed in newspapers and. And Lincoln knew the power of the written word as well as the spoken word. He also knew the importance of the art of fle the fledgling art of photography. And he used it in his campaign in 1860 to humanize him and to get him into the households of the American people. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt famously uses radio for his fireside chats, keeping us all together during the ravages of the Great Depression. Uh, Donald Trump used Twitter pretty well. These vehicles allow us go, to go directly to the American people. And that's what Kennedy did so masterfully with television. He knew that people were going to tune in to those press conferences. And I think the American people, as well as the press, were beguiled by Kennedy. They were charmed by his, his wit 
and his deep knowledge uh, about the issues that he duress, uh, addressed. Those, those uh, press conferences were must-see TV at the Times. Uh, I mentioned that first press conference, which probably got the highest ratings with a third of Americans all tuning in, but they, they got consistently high ratings and were often aired during primetime hours. So Kennedy knew this and was enormously effective at taking his message directly to the American people. Bear in mind, though, that it was a much smaller media universe. You had three television networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. You didn't have the fragmentation and proliferation of media that you see today, which, is, which makes it far more difficult for uh, uh, presidents of different parties to get their messages through. We have Fox News, we have CNN and MSNBC, and they are vastly different, far different than ABC, CBS, and NBC would have been in their coverage. Your first book about the presidency was about post the post-presidential lives of a number of presidents. Obviously, JFK did not have a post-presidential life. You have interviewed seven different sitting U.S. presidents. If you had the opportunity, if it were were possible to to time travel back, what sorts of things would you like to to ask John F. Kennedy? You know, I, I think John F. Kennedy is president in the most dangerous hour in humankind, and that is during the thirteen harrowing days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it was distinctly possible that we would have a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Hugh Seide was a, a dear friend of mine. Hugh Seide, the, the legendary president watcher for Time magazine, which was a, a behemoth at the time. It was John F. Kennedy was acutely aware of what Time magazine was reporting at any given time because of its, of its uh, national and, and international importance. But, but Seide talked to me about visiting with John F. Kennedy during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis and leaving the gates of the, the White House wondering if there would be a tomorrow. I would really like to know from Kennedy what it was like to be president during those mm. desperate hours, taking us through those, those 13 days from day to day. As, as Jacqueline Kennedy later said, she was with the, the president when night beca became day and day became night. They all blended into one another as they faced this crisis, not knowing what was going to happen from, from minute to minute. Kennedy showed his very best in, that, in, in those moments. Uh, you talked about what Joe Biden could learn from him. I think Joe Biden could look at the Cuban Missile Crisis as a quintessential leadership during a crisis. And Kennedy um, never paints himself into a corner. He leaves his options open. He's, he's, he's determined to avoid military conflict as long as he can. He uh, keeps the military, his very jingoistic military advisors at bay, resisting their, um, uh, the, 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 them when they, they implore him to take out these missile sites uh, through airstrikes on the Cuban mainland. Uh, Kennedy doesn't want to do that. He, he creates a blockade instead, a naval blockade, preventing uh, Soviet troops and, and uh, missiles from, from coming in, additional ones from coming in. And he, he tries to find a way out of the, the crisis during these, these 13 days and ultimately does through a back channel negotiation with Khrushchev, which is essentially a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. You remove your missiles from Cuba and we will very quietly remove the missiles that we have in Turkey well after the, the crisis abates, which we make good on. So what we think is a zero-sum victory on the part of the United States is actually a quid pro quo. But this is a long way of answering your question, Marty, which is uh, what, was, what, what are you thinking when the possibility of nuclear annihilation is very real and palpable at any given moment? That I'd like to know, uh, because no president, including Lincoln, I think, ever faced a moment that was that dark. Yeah, he seems to be acutely aware of his mortality, of the, the perils of the time in an almost sort of Shakespearean way, you know, in part uh, because of the enormous dangers uh, with something like the Cuban Missile Crisis. But he was also living it so profoundly. It's just like the, the you know, he's 
his has one son born just after he's elected. He has a son who's born, lives for only two days in 1963. His father, who was this, you know, enormously vital presence, has this stroke during his presidency. Uh, you know, that says there's the sense of uh, the finiteness of life uh, that that just seemed to hover over him uh, throughout his presidency, and it's it it must have been overlaid with with such uh, such difficulty to to, to navigate. I, w I would think it's just something he was he was so aware of all the time. You know, you're so right, Marty, and, th and that's what struck me when I wrote about Kennedy. I I think. He, as much as any president, is aware, uh, aware of the fragility of life. He's acutely uh, aware that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that of, of life's tenuousness. His brother, Joe Kennedy, his older brother, who was the hope of the family. Sure. Uh, the, the, Joe Kennedy Jr. was uh, his father's real political hope for gaining the presidency. But he dies in World War II, struck down in his youth. Uh, his sister dies in a plane accident a year after the war is over. His, his sister Rosemary has mental challenges and is lobotomized and is never quite the same after that. Kennedy, as I mentioned, battles existential health crises himself. Uh, so he knows how fragile life is. And I, I think that's, that stays with him throughout the course of his presidency. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, he stands on the world stage unparalleled. There's no one who rivals Kennedy. And he uses his capital at that moment, this is very telling of John F. Kennedy, to put through uh, the thing that he was most proud of is in his presidency, the nuclear test ban treaty. He wants to eliminate the threat, the, uh, or at least reduce the threat of a nuclear war, nuclear problems in our world. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the moments that struck me is, is uh, Kennedy in September. You mentioned him losing his son, Patrick, um, when Patrick was just two days old. That's in August of 1963. Mm -hmm. The following month, September, uh, he's drifting on a sailboat on the Nantucket Sound, and the wind's quiet for the moment, and he's with friends, and out of the blue, he asks, how would Lyndon be if I were to be killed? Uh, he's thinking about this stuff. Of course, the day he's killed in Fort Worth, before he flies uh, to, that, to, to, to Dallas for that fateful... Uh, a ride in a, in a limousine, he tells Jacqueline Kennedy, you know, there's nothing we can do if some nut goes, is on a roof and, and takes a shot at me. He is really thinking about that. And it's interesting because, as you and I both know as historians, Lincoln was aware of his own mortality, too, and had premonitions mm -hmm. of his own death. So you wonder what Kennedy was thinking in those hours. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating. And can you share the story of... Uh the speech that was never given, the one on November 22nd, 63, that was going to take place in, in Austin, where, where, where you live. That was a fascinating part of the book to me. Well, you know, it was to me, too. You mentioned Doris Kearns Goodwin, and Doris is a friend in which she was, she now lives in Boston, but she was living in Concord, Massachusetts, when her husband, um, Richard Goodwin, died. Um, Richard Goodwin was a speechwriter for John F. Kennedy and later Lyndon Johnson and Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and I was looking through some of his archives and, and actually Doris for the first time had seen this, had seen much of this material as well. And I came across, across a speech and at the top of the speech were, was handwritten speech to be given on 11, 22, 1963. And of course, for any historian that just, you know, my, my heart stopped. And I, I read the, the words that he was to speak that night here in Austin, Texas. And it was quintessential John F. Kennedy, hopeful and optimistic with this great vision for what America can be and should become. Uh, and, and those were the words that, that he never got to, but it, it, was so, um, it was so reflective of what I think John F. Kennedy's legacy is. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's chilling and inspiring, really, all at, all at once. Uh, I see that there are now a number of questions that are coming into the chat, and uh, I think I will filter in some of these. Uh, 
and we have about another half an hour of our our conversation. So here's one. It's, uh, what do you think JFK would do if he were alive and president today? Why? Uh, who are the JFKs of our time? You know, I don't know that there's a JFK of our time or, or uh, if there is, I hope he or she stands up. We definitely need the kind of leadership that John Fitzgerald Kennedy provided. Uh, again, it, it, Kennedy comes into the, uh, the, the presidency relatively callow. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, he's, he hasn't achieved much in the House of Representatives. He hasn't achieved much in the Senate, but he has great aspirations for what he wants to achieve as president. And as I mentioned earlier, gets us thinking beyond ourselves, unites us as a country. Again, I, I want to repeat it because it, it bears mentioning with this question, Kennedy only wins by two tenths of a percentage mm -hmm. point. But by the time he goes into his first year in, in the presidency, just four months into the presidency, when he stubs his toe in Cuba with the, the failed incursion in the Bay of Pigs, uh, he has a, an approval rating that's an astounding 83% because Kennedy was able to bring us together. We've had, you know, we, we had in the previous administration, I think, let's face it, a very divisive president. And we are still suffering from the polarization that that administration inflicted on our country. To a large extent, the media environment that I just described earlier um, exacerbates uh, and perpetuates those divisions. So there are enormous, there are enormous challenges for politicians and for presidents in, in this day and age. But Kennedy, I think particularly with social media and his soaring rhetoric would have an ability to break through and hopefully unite us more so than we are today. Would he see an approval rating of 83%? Probably not, but he would probably see an approval rating, which is uh, a, a little above 50%. Yeah, it's uh, another thing that I think that fueled that to some degree, those high approval ratings was the, the candor, the accountability, the willingness to own up to mistakes, a very refreshing uh, quality that uh, you know, I think American people really appreciate it. And, and he, was, he could really look fairly unflinchingly in, into the mirror. That's a, a rare quality in a leader. You know, it's true, Marty. I, you, you mentioned that uh, I've had the, the privilege of, of interviewing you, you and Alan, seven presidents, and one of them was George W. Bush. And I asked him what the most important quality for a president is, and he uh, immediately said humility, something he learned from his father, our 41st president. Uh, hmm. but, but Kennedy, in, in key moments, shows his humility. Uh, he's never cocky. You know, he's, he's never arrogant. And particularly after the Bay of Pigs, he concedes that those mistakes are his alone. He says that uh, good ideas have many fathers, but a bad idea is an orphan. But at the end of the day, like Harry Truman, he knew that the buck stopped with him. And he not only admitted his, his mistakes, he told the American people he would try to do better. That's a remarkable thing if you, if you think about it in today's America. No doubt about it. It's, uh, it's, it's refreshing. I think there are great lessons for, for leaders today to, to try to do that. Uh, another question that's come through on the chat uh, harks to the earlier part of our discussion about the, the June 61 summit uh, with Khrushchev. And the question is, in your opinion, did JFK properly prepare for that summit? I don't know how you could prepare for a, a summit like that. You had in Nikita Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev was this five foot three inch bantam. He was truculent. He was pugnacious. He was relentless. What he did, I think, very successfully at, at that summit was uh, he kept on making an ideological debate and, and hit Kennedy time and time and time again with why the, the Soviet system was superior. And Kennedy, as eloquent and deft as he was, wasn't able to really respond to that and just got bullied. And again, in his words, savaged by Khrushchev. The one fateful mistake that he makes is he concedes, Kennedy concedes to Khrushchev that they are more or less on an equal plane in the eyes of the, the world and in terms of their military power. And, and that's something that, 
uh, that, that Khrushchev crowed about for the rest of his life. He had the U.S. president saying they were essentially equal in terms of their, their power. It was enormous because the Soviet Union at the end of the day was, uh, had a bit of an inferiority complex when it came to America. So to have the, the American president conceding that they were equal was a huge victory for the Soviet Union. But in terms of preparation, maybe he could have uh, uh, had some uh, simulations, you know, ha had some play acting with folks. Um, and playing the part of, of Khrushchev could have been a pit bull <laughs> to see <laughs> how you keep something that, uh, that aggressive at bay. Uh, Kennedy wasn't successful. But again, I'm not sure intellectual preparation would have necessarily helped him in those moments. Yeah, it's I just uh, popped the book open here for your description of that, which is precious here. You say, uh, over those two long days, as news media across the world awaited even the smallest of updates, the ever composed JFK had finally come face to face with the barrel chested, hot tempered Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. And for perhaps the first time in his life, he worried he was in over his head. Uh, you do, you have a, this sort of mano a mano uh, showdown feeling that does feel almost like a, a prize fight in there. Uh, another question that's come through on the, the chat, uh, which we haven't really addressed. Uh, but you do address uh, real splendidly in the book, uh, is this. It says, in your opinion, how important was Jackie in defining JFK's legacy? Well, she was certainly helpful to the Kennedy image. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy complimented the graceful elegance of, of John F. Kennedy, as did the very vivacious Kennedy family. We were, in, we were uh, uh, captivated not only by John F. Kennedy, but by Jacqueline Kennedy and the young Kennedy children. The last time we had had, we had seen young children in the White House was the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Teddy Roosevelt, the only president to occupy the White House who was younger than John F. Kennedy, uh, albeit not as a president elect. Theodore Roosevelt had taken the presidency upon the assassination of William McKinley at the age of, of 42. So there was the, the, the Jackie, like uh, uh, Jack, um, exuded this this uh, this youthful optimism and this elegance and this eloquence. Uh, she certainly helps when uh, when John F. Kennedy goes to Europe for the first time and she meets with the French. Charles de Gaulle was uh, a pretty sour personality, but he was uh, he, he melted like a pat of butter in a microwave when <laughs> when uh, Jacqueline Kennedy speaks French to him and. Yep. And uh, there is a headline in uh, the, the, the biggest French newspaper the next day about Jacqueline Kennedy as Paris's new queen. Uh, hmm. So the, uh, even the cantankerous uh, Charles de Gaulle is beguiled by, by Jackie Kennedy. So I think she helps enormously. I think she, she also, this is a, a remarkable moment too that I had forgotten until writing the book. Jacqueline Kennedy comes back to the White House during the Cuban Missile Crisis. At one point, he asks her to go to Camp David with the children where they'll be safe. And she says, no, no, we're staying here. If we're going to die, we're going to die together. I want to be with you during these desperate hours. And she's with him at key moments, taking a walk with him around the White House grounds when he wants to clear his head. Uh, you know, they, they had a difficult relationship at times. We talked about that earlier. But during these most desperate hours, she is there for her husband. She wants him to be a great president, and she wants herself to be a first, a great first lady. Uh, interestingly enough, despite all the challenges they face, she called the White House years their happiest years mm -hmm. as a couple. Yeah, that was was uh, quite a powerful sense that she she evoked that she, the grace that she summoned. I mean, it, your, the book is entitled "Incomparable Grace," but it, certainly it radiated out through the family. Uh, another question that comes uh, in the chat here, uh, uh, someone in the audience thanking you for the new book and saying that regarding JFK's press conferences, it is astonishing how well prepared and how well read President Kennedy was. And you, you make that point very thoughtfully in the book, just how absorbed Kennedy would be, how much he, he craved reading material. You talk about a, a contrast with the, the last administration. It just it 
astonishing. Uh, the question that was asked in the chat is, can you speak to how was it that he was able to absorb so much as a, as a reader and as a thinker? You know, he was a, he, he had a, um, a capacious mind and an, and an insatiable intellectual curiosity. He was constantly reading books. Um, aides would talk about him walking around with a book. I mean, he'd walk around, but when he, when he was brushing his teeth, he'd be mm -hmm. looking at a book. He also had an ability, Marty, to, to, to read really quickly. And he, he wants his cabinet members to do so too. And he asks them to take an Evelyn Wood speed reading course <laughs> in order to absorb information. So he was enormously intellectually curious and intellectually capable. And he took that knowledge to his press conferences, which I think uh, helped in the presidency. Again, uh, 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 Kennedy had his sights set on the presidency as soon as he threw his hat in the ring in politics. He was no sooner in the House than he wanted to go to the Senate because he knew that was a route to the presidency. He wants to be in the center of the action and he wants to be prepared for those moments. He wants to do things that are prudent uh, in, the, in the interest of the American people and that necessitates being intellectually prepared. And John F. Kennedy, as much as any chief executive, was, uh, was prepared. Another question here in the chat. This is obviously speculative, but uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on the rumor that JFK had told Evelyn Lincoln he was planning to drop LBJ from the ticket in 1964? You know, I, I, I just don't think that that's, that was probably uh, going to happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have to remember that um, it, it's Lyndon Johnson who probably uh, is the difference on the 1960 Democratic ticket by, by, by providing the Southern balance that was needed. Kennedy was looked upon at the time as a Northern liberal. The Southern states were starting to get a little disenchanted with the Democratic Party, particularly as it related to, to civil rights. Uh, but, and, and Lyndon Johnson gave the, uh, the clout of a Southerner on the, on the ticket. Uh, I don't know, I mean, at, but by the time that Kennedy takes the presidency while he's in office, he gains the favor of the American people. As I mentioned, he has a huge approval ratings in the 70 some percent uh, during, during most of his presidency. So could he have dropped Johnson from the ticket and survived? Almost certainly he could have. Would he have done that? Would he, would he have known that would have hurt him? Uh, it, he probably knew that as well. So I can't imagine him dropping Lyndon Johnson from the ticket, but it was distinctly possible. I think there's a, there are, uh, it, it, people talk about the, 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 I alluded to this earlier, Marty. People talk about the relationships between the Kennedys and Lyndon Johnson. Well, there were different Kennedys, so there were different relationships. Mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy patriarch, was a huge um, champion of Lyndon Johnson. In fact, when it's thought that the Kennedy should be a candidate for, or should, should, should throw his, or tr try to become the vice presidential uh, nominee for the Democratic Party in 1956, his father says you should only do it if Lyndon Johnson is at the head of the ticket, if he is the presidential nominee. And he even tells Johnson that if he decides to run in 56, that he will help to finance the ticket. So that's an enormous endorsement from Joe Kennedy, who was an advocate for Lyndon Johnson on the ticket in 1960 as well. Bobby Kennedy had a famously toxic relationship with Lyndon Johnson. Des they despised one another. Um, so there was a lot of tension and, and Ken Bobby Kennedy tried to cast Johnson out of the White House as much as he could, out of the West Wing. But John F. Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson had, I think, a, a, a great deal of mutual respect for one another. One of the things that John F. Kennedy reminds folks of is that when he wanted to get something done as a senator from Massachusetts, he had to go through the all-powerful Senate Majority yep. Leader, Lyndon Johnson. This, again, this behemoth in the Senate. Lyndon Johnson was perhaps the most powerful Senate Majority Leader in the history of our country. Uh, so John F. Kennedy is aware that Johnson not only is, is, is helpful politically, but he also understands power and he will be a good successor if he dies. And in, and in fact, in those early days in the presidency, Johnson really shows the very best of himself by ensuring that there is a smooth transition after the tragic assassination of John F. Kennedy. Speaking of power and grappling with power, what, what is your sense of uh, 
JFK's relationship with J. Edgar Hoover, who obviously was an enormously powerful figure for a long, long time in Washington. Uh, there was that whole dynamic of uh, Hoover pushing very hard to get this surveillance on Martin Luther King, uh, you know, justified perhaps uh, in some circles by, you know, the association with Stanley Levison. I think it's my reading of that is that that's, uh, I think that was uh, a reach to say that the that King was being driven by any sort of sort of communist agenda. But J. Edgar Hooper was pushing it hard. He got Bobby Kennedy ultimately to uh, agree to for these taps to be placed on King and his his office, the his home and the hotel where he stayed. Uh, what was your read of the the JFK sense of J. Edgar Hoover? You couldn't ignore JFK, or, or sorry, you couldn't ignore J. Edgar Hoover if you're JFK or any president for that matter. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover wielded enormous power. I'm going to quote LBJ, and I'm going to clean up the barnyard language a little bit <laughs> by saying it was better to have J. Edgar Hoover inside the tent urinating out than outside the tent <laughs> urinating in. So you tried to keep Hoover close, knowing that he had probably had information on you that he could use. Uh, and president, you know, the, our presidents were keenly aware of that. You mentioned Stanley Levinson before as being a factor uh, in, uh, in King's life. Um, and the reason that the FBI was, was so wary of King, or one of the reasons, Stanley Levinson had been a communist earlier in his life. And we talked about this period as being the height of the Cold War, when there was definite fear of communism. Bear in mind, this is just a few years after the, the fall of the McCarthy period, but there's still great fear about uh, communists interfering in our system. And Stanley Levinson, again, had declared himself a communist earlier in his life and was a very valuable advisor to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, to his credit, does not cast out Stanley Levinson, even though he knows it's costing him with the FBI. And John F. Kennedy, interestingly enough, I mentioned that meeting that Kennedy has in June of 1963 with the big six civil rights leaders at the White House, where they talked about staging the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. After that meeting where the black when the black leaders go and have a press conference talking about the fact that they will indeed stage that march kennedy calls martin luther king aside they walk through the the rose garden and kennedy says i want you to know you're being wiretapped you have to be very careful and he talks about the fbi's suspicions about him and his communist activity so that's a long way of saying that kennedy and other presidents of that era or of, the, of, the, of those times we're, we're definitely aware of J. Edgar Hoover and uh, operated around him very, very carefully. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating and, you know, I think rather dark saga in a lot of ways in, in American history. And, and, you know, I think what began, uh, you know, as something that was arguably informed by uh, an interest in communist associations really seem to devolve into a, a real effort to invalidate, you know, damage uh, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, looking really underneath every little wrinkle of his life. Um, and that was a, you know, very difficult line, I think, for the, the Kennedys to, to navigate, because it, cer it certainly seemed that this was something the FBI really wanted to, to zero in on in a big way. Bear in mind, too, Marty, as you know, uh, after uh, King gives his uh, I Have a Dream speech, which more I, I think more or less earned him the, the Nobel Peace Prize, that and yeah. the letter from the Birmingham jail and the Birmingham campaign from, from earlier that year, uh, the FBI uh, drafts a memo to Hoover about King and calls him one of the most dangerous men in America. This is after the I Have a Dream speech, uh, showing the power of personality, the, 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 the uh, enormous influence that Kennedy, excuse me, that King has at that moment in time. He becomes a greater threat 
to the FBI. And the FBI could be extraordinarily pernicious. Yeah, it's, it's a, a fascinating saga to, to, to sort of look back on. Uh, writing this book from the state of Texas, and uh, how would you say that uh, JFK, the JFK legacy is regarded in that most complicated of, of states? Uh, what's, what's, what's your sense of, of where where it stands here in May of 2022. You know, uh, there's a, uh, an expression, it's easier to build a, a movement, seriously, it's easier to build a monument than it is a movement. When Kennedy visited here in November of 1963 on his fateful trip to, to Texas, uh, his approval ratings were going down as a consequence of his stand on, on civil rights. So he was enormously controversial and there was a great deal of concern about how he would be received in Dallas in particular, which was a, a, a very conservative part of Texas, dominated in many respects by the John Birch Society, this arch conservative group that was more or less the Tea Party of its times. Uh, and uh, so, so Kennedy was, was not looked upon particularly favorably by the same token, that, that charisma just came through when he came through Texas and he charmed Texans as he did Americans throughout the course of, of his presidency. So Kennedy at the time was, was perhaps not looked upon as favorably as Kennedy now. We now look back at Kennedy as, as being this enormously hopeful and optimistic and inspiring figure, but I'm not sure that all of Texans would have said that in the 19, early 1960s when when Kennedy was in uh, the White House. I will say that some of Kennedy's most indelible moments happen here in Texas. It's here that he defends his Catholicism in 1960 when it's thought that Kennedy perhaps would serve the Vatican more so than he would the American people. It's, it's amazing to think about, but just uh, you know, a little more than two generations ago, we were concerned about having a Catholic in the White House. And Kennedy has to talk about what that means to, what his Catholicism means to him, and what his presidency might mean to America. In the same manner, by the way, that Barack Obama did, talking about his race from the, the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia in 2008. So that's an important moment in, in Kennedy's political life. And an important moment in his presidency was that moment we talked about earlier, when he goes to Rice University and says, we choose to go to the moon, rallying Americans around putting Americans in space on moon for the first time. Talking about that is a distinctly American proposition. And of course, we, we all see those stirring images of Kennedy in the last moments of his life, riding in that motorcade in, in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. Sure, we're, we're coming to the end of our time here, Mark, but I wondered if you could sort of uh, share with us two or three things perhaps that you found particularly compelling in your in your research things that you uncovered that really sort of touched you on a on an emotional level um, as well as an intellectual level. What were the what were the big discoveries here? You know, I think it was I, I, you and I, uh, Marty, have talked a lot about history through the years. As being, uh, you know, when we were when we were kids, we were yeah. fascinated in history, and of course, we would. Uh, come to have history be an important part of our professions. But uh, I think, I, so I, I understood the times, I understood the, the crises, I think that, that Kennedy was dealing with, not, not to the degree that I do now after writing about it, but it was the personal Kennedy that I, I think was the most uh, revelatory aspect to me. Uh, in particular, though you, you mentioned August of, of 1963 when he loses his son, Patrick. Those are some incredibly stirring days. Mm. And as he loses his third child, um, uh, I think that further bounds uh, the uh, American people to the Kennedys and the Kennedys to one another. That brings them closer together in that moment. I also came to appreciate what I talked about earlier, Kennedy's tenuous grasp on life. He realizes how fleeting life can be that informs his life and that informs his presidency more than I imagined. Yeah, I think you render that 
you know, quite, quite powerfully uh, throughout the book. It really is. It's a marvelous read, um, great achievement. And uh, it's been a, just a real thrill for me to be in conversation with, with you about it. Uh, so congratulations and uh, thank you to our audience for what I hope has been a really vigorous and uh, exciting conversation. It certainly has been for me. And I uh, want to thank everybody at the Kennedy Library for making this possible. And Mark, uh, congrats on a wonderful literary achievement here. Well, Marty, thank you very much. And thanks to our friends at the JFK Presidential Library for putting this together. It's been a delight.